Let's recap everything we know about waves. Here's a medium. It's a string. It consists of these particles shown as beads. If I pull this wrench upwards and then downwards, each particle is pulled upward and then downward in, in succession. And so that wave shape gets transferred through the medium. Particles only move up and down. They're not moving across the medium. So there's no net displacement of the particles themselves. If we continue and have this process repeat, this upward and downward motion, then now this source is producing a continuous wave. By contrast, if we do a single pulse, we call this literally a pulse wave. Back to continuous or progressive waves. Progressive waves transfer energy through the medium via these oscillations of the particles. If we change the amplitude, then we're changing the maximum displacement of the particles from this dashed center line from equilibrium. Amplitude is max displacement. Frequency, we can think of in a wave this way. Frequency is how many waves are produced per second. A low frequency means the source produces a low number of waves per second. A high frequency means the source produces a large number of waves per second. Period, time period, is kind of the opposite of frequency. Time period is the time it takes for one wave to be produced. So if I start when this thing is at the top, and then let's go slow motion, I start it right here, and then I let the wave go down, I let this, so we've produced half a wave, we're producing right there, we've produced a full wave. The time it takes is called the period. When it comes to traveling or progressive waves, some look like this, and some look like this. The top is transverse, and it has crests and troughs. The bottom is longitudinal. It has compressions where the, way, uh, the particles are pushed together, and rarefactions where the particles are spread apart. Another way to think about the difference, on the top, energy is being transferred to the right. That's where the wave shape travels. Same as the bottom, energy is transferred to the right. But on the top, the particles oscillate up and down perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. On the bottom, longitudinal, the particle oscillations are left-right, parallel to the energy transfer. This is how we define the difference between transverse and longitudinal waves. In both cases, we can describe the speed of the wave itself, not how fast particles go up and down, but how quickly energy is transferred across, how quickly this crest or this compression travels across the medium. Take a moment. Which wave has a higher wave speed? Clearly the top, because watch my mouse as I track a, uh, a crest. Let me track another one, starting here. These crests go across very fast, whereas on bottom, the compressions are just inching along. We use the letter C for the speed of the wave, and of course, any speed is just the distance traveled over the time it took. But if we let one full cycle pass, capital T for the period, the wave travels one cycle's worth, the wavelength. One over T, however, is equal to frequency, and so this is the equation we use often. It's called the wave equation. Speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. Imagine that we have a speaker in the middle of a room and it's producing a sound. Sound is a longitudinal wave and it's compressions in the air. So a compression spreads out, and it spreads out not just in two dimensions, but three dimensions. There's a sphere of compression emitting or being sent out from the speaker. And so that air compresses and it pushes against its neighbors, so the compression spreads out, and then a new compression comes in its place. Those two spread out, and then another one is produced in its place, and this continues. 
These lines are called wavefronts, and they show where the compressions are located. But compressions, that's another way of saying they're in phase. A rarefaction is halfway through a cycle, but compressions, these are all at the same stage. They're in phase with each other. So the definition of a wavefront is a line connecting points in phase points on neighboring waves. We can also draw a line showing which way those wavefronts are traveling. So these wavefronts that I've just highlighted in purple are traveling out along this way. The guy right here in green that I just highlighted will move out to here and so forth. These wavefronts here are going to travel out along this direction. And we could keep doing this. These purple lines are called rays. And they are lines showing the direction of energy transfer or energy propagation. Now, each wave front, each front of the wave, has a fixed amount of energy and power. And the reason is because uh, we assume there's no damping. So this is only true when there's no damping. And also, there's nothing in the way absorbing the wave, like a chair or something else. As long as we have no damping, we still have that wave spreading out over a bigger and bigger area. This is a much bigger area, and so the energy and power are stretched thin. We call that the intensity. Intensity is how much power the wave or wavefront carries per unit area. Another way to describe intensity, for spherical waves like sound, where the wave travels out in all directions, for spherical waves, the area formula of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, the surface area of a sphere. The unit of intensity comes straight from the equation Power is in watts. Square, uh, when we square radius, we get square meters. So this is our unit of intensity. So far, we've looked at scenarios where the medium goes on forever. It continues out the window. What if we have an end to the medium? Now, if we send a wave along, it reflects. Remember that when the end of the medium is fixed in place, this particle can't move. For fixed ends, waves reflect and they invert, they flip. For a free end where the particle at the end can move, they don't invert. The wave stays on the same side as it reflects, stays on the top side. If we send two waves toward each other, What happens is they interfere. As they approach, they have displacements that they produce in the medium. And at every point where they overlap, those displacements add together. That's called the principle of superposition. And this time, they cancel each other out. These are the two types of interference that occur. When the waves have the same displacements, both positive or both negative, we call it constructive interference because they're constructing a larger version of the wave. But when their displacements are opposite in sign, that's destructive interference. Here we go. This is constructive interference again because they both have the same, their displacements are the same sign positive. Here, destructive because the displacements have opposite signs and so forth. Now, imagine I let this reflection occur, but I'm not going to send a single pulse. I'm going to let the wave continue. When this wave hits the fixed end, it will reflect and invert. And look at what happens over here. All of a sudden, we form a standing wave. As the reflection moves back across, it interferes with the oncoming wave 
and together they form this standing wave that appears to just stand still. Here's another simulation showing exactly that. The green wave is traveling to the right, and then it reflects at the boundary. The blue wave is the reflection traveling back the other way. This, these two things together, the reflection plus the original oncoming wave, they form a standing wave, and the reason why the standing wave can form is because they meet the boundary conditions. So we'll talk about boundary conditions more in another video, but right now all we need to know is that to form a standing wave, you need two identical waves, the reflection and the original oncoming wave. They travel in opposite directions, and they continually interfere with each other. Standing waves can have just a single antinode. That's the part at the middle that reaches maximum displacement. They can have multiple antinodes. Those are the parts here. Now we have two antinodes that reach maximum displacement. This is three antinodes and four antinodes. The locations like the ends where the waves don't move at all, those are called nodes. So there's a node right here, there's a node right here, a node right here, and so forth. This wave is the lowest frequency. This one is far more frequent. There are more wave cycles showing up. When you have waves like this with increasing frequency, we call the higher waves that can be produced on the string, we call them higher harmonics. This is the first harmonic, this is the second harmonic, the third and the fourth. The harmonics are just the particular frequencies of standing waves that can be produced on a string. Or, as we'll learn later, you can produce harmonics, standing waves, on other media too, like inside the air of a pipe.